been restarted. This is Councillor Anne Simpson, Vice Chair of the Buchan Area Committee. Welcome to the Buchan Area Committee meeting of Tuesday the 27th of August 2024. Please note that today's meeting will be recorded. The recording will be published online after the meeting. If any councillor has not been able to access today's agenda, please indicate via the hands up function now. I see no hands. So we have an apology from our chair, Councillor Diane Beebe, Councillor Stephen Smith, and David Mayer. Coming in virtually, we have Councillor Alan Buchan and hopefully Councillor Anna Powell. Can I ask the committee officer to do a roll call, please? Can I ask you the following councillors are in attendance, please? Councillor Ann Simpson? Here. Councillor Matthew James? Here. Councillor Alan Buchan? Present. Councillor Jeff Cousin? Yeah. Councillor George Hall? Present. Councillor Leanne McQuinney? Here. Councillor Colin Simpson? Present. And I'll just check that Councillor Hannah Powell has not managed to get in just quite yet. Councillor Hannah Powell? No. Okay, thank you. Um, the following officers will also be in attendance this morning. Amanda Rule, Booking Area Manager. Suzanne Ward, Solicitor. Mike St. Dreamy, Solicitor. Sally Wood, Senior Planner. Malcolm White, Team Leader. Jeannie Duffy, Principal Engineer. Bart Daliel, Affordable Housing Officer, and myself, Teresa Wood, Area Committee Officer. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Teresa. Do members have any declarations of interest? Please indicate using the hands up function. For members joining virtually, can I remind you, should you intend leaving the meeting for a particular item, you should indicate you intend doing so as the committee officer will require to remove you from the recording. You should not rejoin until invited back in at the conclusion of that item. Councillor James? Yeah, thanks, Chair. I have a transparency statement to make in relation to item seven uh, by virtue of a reference to a former employer uh, who was no longer trading. Uh, as this is remote, I will stay and take part in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So we move on then to item 2A, the public sector equality duty guidance. Should any member not agree with the guidance, please indicate via the hands up function. I see no hands. Item 2B, the resolution. The committee is asked to note that the, at the request of the author of, of, author of item 11, the exempt item has been withdrawn. The report is expected to come back to the Buccaneer Committee in due course. Thank you. So, before I proceed, we have some good news stories from Buchan. Jupit's Lego saw the return of the gala this year thanks to the efforts of Andy Jupit and the Adventures crew, backed by local businesses and the community. Somewhat, sometime in June, Andy and his crew decided they wanted to bring back a gala, and on the 23rd of June, Andy held a sponsor walk to raise funds. He walked 140 miles over seven days. With a substantial amount raised and little time, the gala, dubbed NP24, was organised from the 29th of July through to the 4th of August, a whole week of events for young and old. From clairvoyance to comedians, nerf wars to a cowboy cookout, the gala had something for everyone. Finishing with a week of stalls, carnival games and a mini festival of music. It's fair to say that to organise something and make it happen in less than two months in itself is magical. This is only one of the many events that Andy Jukit and Adventures put on for the community and the kids and not only restricted to new bits like While some events are fundraisers, these are usually to aid fund free of charge events for the kids, making them available to everyone. Our grateful thanks go to Andy and the Adventures crew. Could we possibly send a letter? Thank you. And then secondly, this year's Scottish week was a truly a week of fantastic events. There really was something for everyone to enjoy. It was great to see Peter Head so busy, with lots of folk from the town and the surrounding area, and many tourists deciding to make Peterhead their base for the week, so they could enjoy the many events that start from starting in the morning right through to the evening. The Peterhead Scottish Week Committee did themselves and Peterhead very proud with the programme that they managed to deliver. 
the amount of time given to such an event should never be underestimated. A huge round of applause to each one of you for the time and effort each of you gave over many months in Crown And again, a uh, letter to my We're moving on then to item three, the draft minute of the meeting of the 25th June 2024. Should any member not agree with the content of that draft minute, please indicate via the hands up function. So it looks like everyone is happy with that, Teresa. So moving on then to item four, uh, ENQ 2023 1475, St. Fergus Site OP1 Master Plan. We have a request to address the committee in relation to this master plan report from the agent, Mr. Craig Fivey of Baxter Design. Can I confirm Mr. Fivey is in attendance? Yes, thank you. Welcome to the meeting of the Buccaneer Committee. For your information, I can confirm that we have seven members of the Buccaneer Committee in attendance today. In line with Council's procedure, I'm now going to ask, now going to confirm the committee wish to hear your representation. I will then ask the senior planner, Sally Wood, to present the report before asking you to address committee. When you're invited to speak, you will be given five minutes to put forward your representation. After that, members may ask questions. Thank you. So committee members, should a member not agree to hear the representation, please indicate via the hands up function. Again, so we're, we're happy to go. Sally, could you present the report then, please? Morning everyone. So this is the master plan for the OP1 site at St Fergus. The OP1 site is an allocation within the local development plan and it is allocated for residential development for 38 houses. Development plans, or should I say 38 homes, sorry. The development plan specifically states for this site that the master plan is required as stated within the settlement plan, appendix 7 of the local development plan, and it's also required by policy at P1. A master plan must be prepared with public consultation and then agreed by the local area committee for it to be on material and consideration. The aims of the master plan are set out in section 1.1 of the committee report, but it has many components and aims, including good placemaking, ensure future developments are designed to the high standard, encompass social, environmental and economic considerations to create the sustainable community for the future. And they act as a framework to a subsequent planning application. A master plan does remain valid for five years once um, agreed or until an application has been granted and implemented. The master plans plan sets out the framework for community participation, site planning, transport, servicing, community facilities, design, ecology and landscaping, rather well, strategic landscaping, and it should establish key principles which future development then should accord with. And they are a material planning consideration, although the primacy of the development plan still remains imperative. Section 3.3 .3 of the committee report outlines requirements that any application should consider in developing the OP1 site. And members may be already aware that the eastern portion of the site has already obtained planning permission for 20 houses, which was granted in June 2020. The planning history is cited within the report. There is, on this western portion, three houses granted as outlined in the 2022 planning application, but three further houses in the northwestern corner were refused by the Open Committee in line with the officer recommendation. As it was evident that a framework, i.e., the master plan, had not been approved, and the development was at that time very piecemeal with no consideration of the sort of wider infrastructure requirements. Both those applications were determined by the area committee and accepted the recommendation by the planning service. This approach was in contrast to the eastern portion of the OP1 site, which proposed 20 houses in a single planning application, which illustrated the layout, including connectivity and open spaces. It was at that time uh, noted that the developer of the eastern site advised that the western portion was under challenges in terms of land ownership and unlikely to come forward. So that application was referred to the planning committee and noting that a master plan hadn't been submitted at that time, but a council nonetheless has a requirement to determine planning applications, a statutory requirement. 
but it must be noted that a stronger emphasis is placed on master plans with the adoption of the Local Development Plan 2023 and by National Planning Framework 4. The proposed master plan before committee today shows 15 dwellings, a landscape strategy including open space and connectivity including roads. Some of the master plan is arguably a little too detailed in that it has shown the layout of the houses on the plots and the planning service has advised that some of these will require attention in any future planning applications, including the phasing of the development proposed as well. However, this level of detail doesn't form part of the master plan, but rather the area zoned for residential, the open spaces, roads, it effectively is the wider jigsaw, the framework for the pieces of the plan applications will sit within. Any future planning application or applications then will be judged on their own merits in accordance with the development plan and master plan will form a material consideration should it be agreed today. I'll show you um, the presentation. Wait until the screen's got blank. Okay, I'm trying this again then. Certainly sure that I'm not talking. Okay, um, I'm advised that certainly shared on the laptops. Um, so if members can make a refer to the laptops and certainly those that have maybe not had the opportunity to look at the presentation. The presentation clearly was online as of yesterday. Um, slide two, I've moved to slide two, and that shows um, the site in the context of St. Burgess. Um, as you're probably all aware, St. Burgess lies to the north of Peter Head. And um, slide three shows the uh, boundary of the master plan. Sorry, I've jumped ahead there. Um, slide seems to be a bit big on that one. Let me Slide three, so that's the site of the master plan. Slide four shows the proposed site and um, outlined in red on an aerial image and to the right um, of that picture, which is the east, shows the development that's currently um, being finalised. And that is under separate ownership from the west portion of the OP1 site. Slide five will show the proposed master plan. So you can see the areas of the roads, the drainage, which is to the south of the site, um, and the areas of open space, and the general areas for housing. Slide six shows an analysis in terms of the path layouts and the linkages to other. Um, aspects within uh, St. Fergus, for example, the Iron Pool and Park. Slide seven shows the phasing plan. Now, this has been submitted as part of the master plan, but it is unlikely that this will be supported in any planning application because it is a requirement for developments to accord with um, the development plan's primacy. So, in terms of affordable housing, and that I think that's likely to require to come on board, recognising that there's already been three houses granted. Um, on the east side of this uh, portion of the site, and that's the white area of land along Newton Road um, that had planned permission that was granted as a departure development plan, recognising that it was between the 2017 and the 2023 plan at that time, so it was granted as a departure. Just some photographs which really sort of um, aid council's understanding. So, and um, this is looking um, to where the road would connect, that's slide eight, sorry, where it connects internally between the development sort of east side and the west side and then some general sort of um, views this one's looking towards Newton Gardens from Kinloch Road um, and these the areas of proposed suds you can see it's generally low line which is what you would expect. Slide 10 uh, along the slide boundary with Newton Road. 11 is looking south across towards Kinloch Road um, and again south east New Gard Newton Gardens. There is to the uh, west of the site. We've got Kremlin just in the technology. 
So the most the site of two listed buildings, the Category B uh, church and the Category C manse, which um, again will form more detailed consideration of any plan application, but landscaping could be uh, accommodated within any proposed plots. Um, and then that's just to show again, this is a slightly dated photo. The slide on the photo on slide 13 shows that the trees have um, uh, matured somewhat after some of the work that happened to them in 2022 there. Um, but again, it just sort of shows the um, general land in the distance there, sort of on the left to middle, you can see the residential development was previously granted on the eastern portion of the site. Um, and then that's just looking west of um, towards uh, Newton Road. So just to conclude that today, the, it is recommended that the committee agree the master plan for the site OP1 St Fergus as a context with general layout and approach for the subsequent planning applications, and agree the master plan for site OP1 St Fergus to be used as a material consideration of termination of any sort of subsequent planning applications. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Mr. Fidey, can I invite you to address the committee? You have five minutes of people. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, members. The master plan is already made by Sally. It's just been recommended for people. Therefore, I'll keep the presentation very brief. My request is to be submitted so that I can be of any help with any questions or those from members. We've been very careful to design the master plan in such a way that connectivity is improved between Kirtle, sorry, Newton Road and the adjacent ARD development to the east. We took into consideration many comments from the public consultation and have ensured that we have addressed as many points as possible. These comments centred around usable open space, various comments on housing varieties and retained connection to the local primary school and community play park. A detailed list of these comments raised by the public is contained within the master plan document. It is our belief that we've produced a master plan that is suitable for OP1 and it is our hope that members would be able to agree the master plan this morning. I'm happy to answer any questions that members may have. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Craig. Do members have any questions for Mr. Fivey? No, no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for your representation. Now, I'll open it up for discussion. Um, I believe Councillor Powell has now joined us, but because I don't think she was here for all of it, she won't be able to participate in any discussion. That's the advice I'm having from my legal colleagues on, on my right. Yeah, that's correct. Thank you. But we'll notice for, note for the minute that Councillor Powell has now been able to join us, thankfully. But I'm to assure you, I hope it's resolved for the whole duration of the meeting, hopefully. For the recording, if you could run, confirm that unfortunately the planning PowerPoint is not presenting on the hub. However, all councillors are able to view it on their laptops and it's been available online since yesterday. So in terms of the information in front of us, we do have it. So just to make sure everybody is aware of that. So should any member consider they haven't received enough information and feel able to participate in the determination of the report, please indicate now and give it a hands up. Again, there's no hands up. I think we're all comfortable that we've, we've got the info we need. Thanks, Sir James. Apologies, sir. A couple of questions for the planning officer. Yeah, I haven't. I haven't. Oh. Been, I'm just about to ask if uh, you have any questions for council officers. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. Apologies. Um, so just a couple of questions uh, that you covered uh, in your. Um, your presentation there, please, Sally. Um, firstly, the facing plan, uh, you mentioned the interaction with affordable housing. Could you just go through that point a bit more detail? I, I think I lost the thread slightly on what you were saying on that one. So if you could pick up on the facing plan point. Uh, and secondly, within the documentation, um, like within actually the public consultation comments, um, it's mentioned that uh, generally they felt the current housing development was poorly implemented and the agent rightfully reflected this sad to see. There's a number of reasons for that. Um, and I guess my comment is, given that this is a split site in which we're only seeing the master plan coming forward now, um, would that have been something that could have been picked up if the, if the site had been master plan more wholly uh, to start with, appreciating that it was in that in-between development plan time frame? Thank you. So in respect of the phasing, 
that's an illustration, a layout that is contained within the submitted master plan. But there are concerns in respect of the affordable housing being reserved to the last phase of the development proposed. But it really depends how the development might come forward. So historically, as you can see on the planning history, we had three houses in the northeast corner of this portion, and that was granted planning permission. We then saw a subsequent application for three additional houses in the northwest corner. So cumulatively, those six houses would have required 25% to be affordable because it's over the four unit requirement. So in respect of the affordable housing element, there would have to be elements of affordable housing that come supporting with the application, be it that it's land reserved or be it that it's, that's for affordable housing and the consultee to agree at the time through, you know, at a plan application submitted. So what we're effectively saying by that is that it would be that this affordable housing wouldn't be the last matter such it would have to be, uh, sorry, dealt with uh, through applications. But of course, unfortunately, I don't have a crystal ball, so I don't know if the application will come in as an entirety or if it'll come through piecemeal. So that's what that reference was with regards to. In respect of um, current development poorly integrated and split sites, I'm not actually quite sure what aspects you're trying to refer to there, what the concerns are. If you could clarify, please. Um, I might I might have missed a couple of words in between just in my hearing, I'm afraid. Oh, thanks, yeah. Um, firstly, thanks on the, the comment on the phasing plan. That, that does make more sense, and I, I think it's, it sounds like it's subject to the how the planning provisions come forward in the future. Um, my comment regarding the uh, kind of the master plan, you know, the, the OP1 as a whole was considered as one large site under, now, uh, under the current and previous development plans. Uh, obviously, a section of that was approved under a previous application um, during that interim period between development plans, uh, and it was deemed at that point that the master plan, although it would have been preferred, I understand, it didn't necessarily need to go forward at that point. Now, we're seeing comments within the public consultation um, from the agent, uh, kind of interpretation of, of what went forward in that um, public consultation, that it doesn't seem, let's just get the wording to come again. Um, that generally they felt the ARD housing development was poorly implemented. Um, and there's other comments regarding the links to the, the play parts, something in which the agents likely resolved as part of this master plan process. But as a community as a whole, and some folks as a whole, I suppose the comment would be if we'd seen this master plan as, as one, you know, one development, would we have seen perhaps a implementation that would have been more favorable? And um, that's maybe a more opinion piece rather than it's making that. Yes, I, I didn't understand the poorly implemented comment. Still 100% don't understand the poorly implemented. Is that the build that was poorly? But in respect of the linkages, um, as you can see in the planning history, I think it's 3.5 of the committee report, the OP1 area to the east was granted in 2020. So we weren't in between um, development plans at that point. We were solidly within the 2017 plan. It was dealt with under the Scottish planning policy. So there was no, I mean, we know it'd be a development plan around the corner, but at that point it had really no materiality and it was square within the 2017 plan. The 2017 development plan did encourage a master plan for the wider OP1 site. Um, that was another reason why that application at that time was determined at committee and uh, the planning service didn't shy from that fact. We also have a statutory duty to determine planning applications as well. Um, at that time, the planning service was informed that the uh, West side was under separate ownership, potentially associated with the church grounds. And it was at that time foreseen not to come forward. We have no reason to doubt that. And that was the information that were given at that time. The plan and application um, that was lodged was for the whole of that east portion, if you like. It wasn't coming in piecemeal, unlike the west portion, which was sort of coming in three at a time. Um, so we have a statutory duty to determine applications. It was in the gift. Um, at that time for the area committee to review that application felt that was material but it was felt that the um, development of the east side wouldn't stymie the west um, again I suppose the comments you just made demonstrate the advantages of a, of a master plan um, had the, you know it's a material consideration in respect of the new development plan which this application is subject to um, the um, 2023 20, um, and the NPF4, it's a 
obviously the material consideration today from like the 2017 plan and there's a stronger emphasis on the master plan um, the OP wants to like retains the requirement for a master plan, but it was actually specifically stated in policy this time, which I think is in con um, in contradict with what the 2017 plan did. So while it encouraged it, it wasn't actually a policy hand the hat off, if you like. And um, in respect of the way that the applications came forward for the West portion, we weren't seeing that overall framework. Hence why um, it's been um, welcomed that the um, applicant has um, addressed that concern now and that should then provide the framework for future plan applications. I hope that's addressed your query. Okay, thank you. Thank you Sally. I don't see any further questions so can we take a look at the recommendations? So 1-3, committee's recommended 1-3-1, agree the master plan for site OP1 St Fergus as the context of the general layout and approach for subsequent planning applications. And 132, agree the master plan for site OP1 St Fergus to be used as a material consideration in the determination of any subsequent planning applications. Agreed? Thank you very much. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Mr. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. Move on then to item five, the North East Scotland Trail. And I asked all the five team leaders to present this report, please. You can all come with us. Mm -hmm. um, Sally, excuse me. Sorry, excuse me for interrupting. I think you're still sharing at the room. The team has collapsed and turned everything off. I can't get out. It's just about to try and address it. We have the technical gremlins have sent up once today. I'll see it again. I was going to try and address oh, it. That's it. It's, it's out. It's out. It's out. It's out. It's out. It's out. I had to force closure of my laptop. Okay. Well, thank, you very much. thank you, Sally. So, Mr. White, you know, the presentation will be clear to share his one, hopefully. See what this happens. Please, uh, yes. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. So, if you'd like to just make a step, please, that would be great. Pardon, I couldn't hear you clearly there, sorry. If you'd like to just make a start to your presentation, Malcolm, that would be fine. Yep, no problem. Thank you, Chair. Since the Infrastructure Services Committee on 15th June last year, where the committee agreed to support the project for a good quality continuous coastal path between Cullen and St Cyrus, there has been progress on a number of matters relating to the project which Aberdeenshire Council officers have either delivered or assisted with through working with a number of stakeholders involved. Through a survey issued to stakeholders who have been attending meetings on the project and as listed in Appendix 1 of the report, the, rep the proposed working name for the project was agreed as North East Scotland Coastal Trail. A brief for the project setting out the vision, mission, mission statement and strategic objectives were also agreed, which can be seen within Appendix 3 of the report. One of the main points to take forward by officers since the previously stated meeting of the Infrastructure Services Committee was to look at options for developing a model for the overall management and coordination of the coastal path under this project. A number of sessions were held with a range of organisations that are responsible for long distance routes. A summary of, the, of this information can be found within Appendix 2 of the report. Although each organisation was different and the characteristics of the North East Scotland Trail project is different from many of them, it was still apparent that having a core of active volunteers was key to the successful operation of an organisation and they weren't all reliant on local authority funding. Based on this and in alignment with the new council plan, it is recommended that the council do not become a formal constituted partner of any organisation created which holds the council to a financial commitment into the future. The Council would though continue to work in partnership with the overarching organisation created and be part of the overall partnership with other stakeholders through its role as the access authority for the sections within Aberdeenshire, as a land manager on sections where it has this responsibility, and through supporting and building capacity in communities to help them deliver projects which link into and contribute to the overall development of the trail. At the stakeholder group meeting held on 30th May this year, there was no objection to this approach by the Council. Since this time, volunteers who put themselves forward at, at the meeting on 30th May held an inaugural meeting of the Trust to be formed where trustees were appointed to, to the appropriate office bearing roles and they agreed to name the organisation North East Scotland Coastal Trust. They also agreed on the next steps 
to be undertaken to get the trust formally registered with Oscar. Details of other updates relating to the project undertaken directly by or have been input to by Aberdeenshire Council since June uh, 2023 is contained within Appendix 4 to the report. In terms of bucking itself, a throw sections of the coastal path require repairing and upgrading. The majority of it is existing already, including sections on the beach north of Peterhead. This is in comparison to other coastal areas within Aberdeenshire, where there are substantial gaps on the route and sections in a much poorer condition. Therefore, from an Aberdeenshire Council officer perspective, resources have been focused more on these areas rather than in Buchan. We have, however, looked to improve the connections onto the route through the upgrade works undertaken at Scotston Beach Access Road and Car Park at St Fergus. Going forward in Buchan, the priorities will be to look to get local volunteers involved, repairing and upgrading the existing sections of the route which aren't on the beach, and signposting, including connecting existing natural, cultural and historical assets of interest to the route. Going forward, to ensure elected members are best kept up to date with the project, it is proposed to hold a session with all four coastal area committees every six months at the same time. A briefing paper would be provided in advance of each session, with an opportunity for elected members to ask any questions and seek clarification on any queries they had in respect of the project at the meeting. I would welcome any comments that can be included that can be included back to the Infrastructure Services Committee on the delivery of the project over the last 14 months, and in particular on the proposed role of the Council within the overarching organisation being developed to lead on the project and to provide six monthly informal briefing sessions jointly to the four coastal area committees within Aberdeenshire. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. And thank you for a very comprehensive report. Um, personally, um, I think there's been lots of good progress made, but I'll make it, open it up to questions from the floor, please. Hands. Oh, yes, there are. Councillor James. Yeah, thanks, Sharon. This is probably more a comment than a, a question, but I think I'll, I'll probably refer to 3.6 where, where it's referenced to the Council of Connection to this trust. Um, I think this partnership approach is, is very positive to see, um, and then the Council must take a step back and, and let the trust and develop its own, own way uh, and, and lead things. So I think that, that is important uh, for a project like this to see the community come forward. Um, you know, 3.7 does talk about how the elected members are going to interact with this overarching organisation. I do wonder if that needs a bit of further discussion once all committees have looked at this and whether or not we want to have something more formal in terms of uh, providing comment to this trust in the future. Um, but yeah, don't generally welcome the approach that's, that's been taken here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Um, are there any other comments, questions? I'll just add to another comment then as chair. Um, I, I think this is a fantastic idea. The um, long distance trails are really, really popular in terms of bringing tourism to the northeast. And this particular trail, I think, would be quite challenging and also particularly attractive because the views from it will be absolutely stunning. Um, I also wanted to, to, to reiterate what Councillor James said about the partnership approach because I do think that links very much into the council, new council plan and the, the, the you know, strategy for place. Um, I have one concern, which is possibly about the sustainability of the trust, the new trust that's been set up in terms of volunteers, but you, you, I would have that concern about the sustainability of any new organisation. So we have to wait and see, but I suppose I just need your assurance that the council will continue to support that trust in terms of um, helping with funding applications or helping with governance if required. So that's my, my comments, Malcolm. But thank you. It's a, a great piece of work and it's so good to see uh, the progress on it. And it's a very thorough report. So thanks on behalf of the committee. The recommendations then are to note the progress made to date on the delivery of the North East Scotland Coastal Trail project since June 2023. And one, two, two, to make comment to Infrastructure Services Committee on the continued approach by the Head of Environment and Sustainability to take the project forward, in particular on Aberdeenshire Council's role for the overarching organisation being developed to lead on the project and to provide six monthly informal briefing sessions jointly to Bartham Bucket, Bucket for Martin and Kincardine and Mayor's area committees on progress of the project. So we agree. 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on then to item six, which is the Roads Winter Maintenance Policy 2024 review. And can I ask Jenny Duffy, Principal Engineer, to present this report, please? Thank you, Chair. The road service is reporting to you today in regards to the roads winter maintenance policy, which is due its five year review. Um, the policy will, was last approved at Infrastructure Services Committee in May 2016. As part of the Council's scheme of governance, the five year review will be presented to ISC for approval. Whilst it's not necessary to consult the area committees for ongoing policy review, um, the Chief Officer has an option to refer to the area committees if they feel it's justified. It was felt it would be beneficial to bring the paper to area committee as the roads winter maintenance is a fundamental service delivered each year. Um, we would welcome your comments on the draft policy, hence this report today. Um, it is worth highlighting some key data on roads winter maintenance. The 24-25 roads winter maintenance budget is set at 8.176 million, which was approved by full council in February this year. Uh, historically, there has been approximately 3 million in winter reserves, however, however, this year it has been reduced to zero. Over the past three years, actual winter spending has ranged from 5.2 million to 6.9 million, um, with this, this year's projection for the 24-25 season being approximately 7.7 .7 million, which is based on an average winter. Winter costs can vary significantly from year to year due to various factors, including the severity of the weather. Also, increases in the cost of materials, labour and equipment, which, like many other industry sectors, has soared in the last two years. This um, variability is also evident in the past three years' salt usage, which has ranged from approximately 36,000 to 49,000 tonnes, and in person hours, which has ranged from 35,000 to 52,000 hours. I think it is worth highlighting the, um, the variability, which is evident in roads winter maintenance delivery. As part of the policy review, process, we engage with members of the public through our online engagement platform, which saw uh, 1,831 responses to our survey. This was a relatively good um, response rate, which made up of a variety of stakeholders, including engagement and representation from disabled organisations, community councils, school boards, emergency workers and several other groups. Um, the policy review concluded that our po the policy review, sorry, concluded that our policy should continue to follow a prioritisation approach regarding treatments. This will be achieved by applying a risk-based approach in line with the professionally managed highways infrastructure code of practice. By applying a risk-based approach, priority will be given initially to the more important routes with extension to the lesser important routes when practical. 63% of the respondents agreed with this approach. We made some minor amendments to the policy statement to include types of treatments provided. However, the proposed policy's principles is the same as the existing policy. To support the policy, we have a road maintenance operational plan in Appendix 2. This operational plan is reviewed each season post winter to look at areas for potential improvement. For the season ahead, we have made some changes within the plan regarding communication, winter readiness and the rural gripping criteria. Um, we have also engaged with existing snowboarding volunteers um, and 53.8% of the respondents emphasised the need to increase advertising and review the equipment used in spreading salt. So several volunteers suggested providing posters to promote the scheme within their neighbourhoods and communities. This need for better advertising was also um, highlighted by our public engagement survey, where 82.3% of respondents reported not being aware of the snowboarding scheme. In response, we will be creating new posters for the existing snow wardens and asking community councils to help promote the scheme. Um, we will also enhance our social media outreach to increase awareness of the snow warden scheme. Um, we will promote personal responsibility and a proactive approach to winter as well. So, for example, individuals wearing appropriate footwear during the season. Um, the service strives to continually review how we provide our winter maintenance operations. Uh, with some aspects of this delivery which will require longer periods of development. One such item is the route priorities and how these are established. So currently our team is reviewing the network hierarchy and is expected that the outcome of this will have an impact on the winter hierarchy. 
The service understands the significance of importance that real-time information can provide, and we are actively looking at making improvements to the website and processes. So some examples of these include live camera feeds on the road network, grid pile locations and the ability to log them, um, an information piece explaining the grid process, um, expected completion timelines of treatments, live updates on weather conditions and live updates on severe weather road closures. The roads, uh, the roads Winter Maintenance Operation Delivery is one of the key projects that our service delivers each year, and the policy and subsequent procedures that are developed, reviewed and refined are the tools that allow us to deliver this in the most efficient manner. We welcome any of your comments, uh, which will be fed into the report that is delivered to ISC, um, which will allow the policy to be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeannie. That was a very comprehensive introduction of a complex paper, um, well written paper. So thank you for that. Can I invite comments or questions from the floor, please? Mr. James. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the introduction. Um, a couple of comments, please. Uh, firstly, within your introduction, you mentioned about the network hierarchy being reviewed. Um, how long is that review going to? And is that something that we're going to see come out through this winter's maintenance scheme, or is that likely going to be you know, over the next year? And we will, will we see sight of what that network hierarchy is going to be and feed into it if needed? Um, and the second comment is around 3.4.4, uh, which refers to some discussions being held with legal and insurance co colleagues on uh, communities uh, expressing desire to, to snow clear with mechanical means. Uh, how far are those discussions? Um, it, it sounds like you know, quite quite a good idea, and something that we've heard on a few different community aspects in the past, uh, which never seemed to quite get off the ground, unfortunately. So, is, is that something that's, that's relatively well progressed? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in regards to the first question regarding the network hierarchy, um, we held a workshop back at the beginning of the year with um, the Infrastructure Service Committee members um, and we gathered feedback from that and there's been an ongoing um, process in that. So we're hoping that we will be delivering on that this year for the network hierarchy side. So it's unlikely that it will be implemented for this winter season. Um, we expect to see that in the uh, winter season next year. In regards to 3.4.4 um, or the legal and insurance, we have made some progress and we still are in discussions with legal. Um, the challenges around this is the risk of the activity. Um, there has been several feedback provided within the from yourselves and also from the responses we receive from the public um, where there's an appetite for more self-help, um, particularly around about the use of mechanical plant. Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Um, I will make another comment then. I was interested in the interest that is expressed in this paper about the snowboarding scheme and the steps that you're planning to take. Could I suggest that you um, can email a poster to all the parent councils, so it's not just community councils, because um, community councils only, um, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> community councils uh, represent a small part of the community and a lot of the parents who are keen to see their children walk safely to school um, may well help in terms of the state that they live in with snow clearing if they're able to do so. Um, if they're not if they're not at work, so I just I think involving um, children and parents is quite a good way forward with that as well. Uh, apart from that, I don't think there is any other comments. I would welcome what Councillor James has said in terms of harnessing, um, you know, um, desire for communities to help the council deliver services, and if we try and iron out those insurance and legal issues as soon as we possibly can. It doesn't just refer to your service, Janie. It's an aspect that affects landscape, it affects um, culture and sport. So it's something we need to, to bottom out as a council. But thank you very much again for your for, for your report. Um, we'll move on to the recommendation then. It's simply one, one, two, one. To consider comment on and or make recommendations to Infrastructure Services Committee on the draft road maintenance policy appended to this report. Agreed? Thank you very much. 
Right, moving on then to item seven, the Strategic Housing Investment Plan 2025-2030, sometimes called the SHIP. Um, if I can ask Clark Dale and Fortable Housing Officer to present this report, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Hey, can I just give my apologies? I've got an issue with my webcam today, so it'll just be audio only. So apologies again. That's all right, Clark. We've all been having gremlins with the technology this morning, so as long as we can hear you fine, we're grand. Thank you. OK, thanks, Chair. I'm here today to present the, the Draft Strategic Housing Investment Plan for 2025 to 2030. We're essentially looking for Bucking Area Committee to provide comments for Communities Committee on the draft plan. The plan effectively guides affordable housing investment in Aberdeenshire. Aberdeenshire Council are required to submit the Strategic Housing Investment Plan to the Scottish Government each year. Members will note that the plan could potentially deliver 1,879 properties across Aberdeenshire, with around 584 for particular needs, of which 239 are potentially wheelchair accessible. Members will also note that of the 1,879 properties, there are potentially 351 for booking. And I'm happy to feed back any comments. Thank you, Clark. Thank you, Clark. Can we open to questions then or comments, please? Councillor James. Yeah, thank you, Chair. A couple of comments. Uh, firstly, with regard to Appendix 2, um, under Buckingham, where we've got referral to Longside Bridge End Farm, uh, and it refers to the developing in Taylor design as uh, in relation to my transparency statement. That, that's no longer the case, um, and that hasn't been the case for a few years now. That's now Anglican developments. I think it's worth updating that, so at least we're speaking to the right people about these affordable homes. Uh, sites. Um, so if that could be updated, please. Um, yeah. Secondly, yeah. within uh, the main body of the report under 3.7, I was wondering if you could give us a bit more context uh, on the statement within there that says um, that we're seeing tender validity period increasing over the last 12 months, which is positive and indicating towards a level of market stability. Um, so I mean, on that sort of basis, are we seeing market volatility within the construction industry steadying over the last few months? Um, and is that something that we're seeing across the board? Uh, it'd be interesting, kind of just on where we're, we're seeing that and, and what we're kind of deeming inflation to be loosely within, within that um, within that statement that you've got. Uh, and my final sort of comment is within the, the just a second within the, the, the appendix one. Um, be quite interested, if possible, to have a bit of an informal session around the um, new Scott integration strategy and, and how we're seeing that develop across Bucking as a whole. Um, even just a, a small informal session on that would be quite helpful. Um, that's my comments. Thank you. Yeah, no, you. no problem at all. Uh, regarding the, the current the, the market, we've uh, taken advice from our QSs and the, the information they've seen seems to uh, say that it's settled down. Certainly before the last couple of years has been tenders are like over 30 to 40 percent, uh, like over what they were expecting. So it seems to have come, come right down now. So we're hoping it's kind of the markets eventually kind of st uh, stabilised. So we'll we'll know with we'll we'll know with some projects that we're putting out to tender shortly if if that's I um, uh, what they are uh, predicting. Thank you, um, Clark. I'm, I'm I'm curious. This um, see in appendix one, the first bit of the table for the housing demand scores. I'm just curious as how those housing demand scores are assessed. Um, yes. Inverurie sitting at eight thousand and seventy three, and Blackburn down at five eight four. I just wondered how you pull those figures together. Yeah, sure. So the, the the figures for the waiting list first choice were taken for each settlement for the last five years, and the average waiting list figures over the last five years were calculated. So the turnover per settlement was also looked at. This was calculated by the average lets over the fa the last five years divided by the stock. So this shows the proportion of stock becoming available per year. So that the house and needs score for each settlement was calculated by taking the average waiting list demand over the last five years and dividing this by the turnover figure. So basically it's saying 
if you've got two settlements the same with similar waiting lists, if, if you've got like a higher, one that's got higher turnover than the other, then that would get a lower score. But if, certainly if there's any specific settlements that you would like comparisons, I can I can get that information for you if you want. No, I was, I was just I was just curious because yeah. Um, yeah. it's just a figure and I just wondered how it was calculated. I understand because I know there's very little turnover in Minflong um, yeah. and I know there's a big waiting list for it. And we've certainly got Peterhead quite high in terms of demand on that list. It's the third um, highest. Um, so it's good to hear that there are 351 houses planned for, for Buchan. I just hope the finance is there to do that. Well, it's all with, to do with the the government. What's what 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 we can get going forward? So, well, yeah, we'll, I mean, we'll I know, wait and see. But it's all know, just Scottish, a, yeah. Scottish government dropped the amount of affordable housing budget available across the whole of Scotland last year. So I suppose we'll just have to wait and see what 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 does come along. I have another um, councillor James. Is that a legacy hand? Sure, yes. Yes, I have councillor Crossan wants to come in now, please. I just wanted to ask more, sorry to come to the report, I wanted to ask more about um, what Councillor Simpson was uh, asking you about. So if you're scoring it on the wait and list and demand for people to get into a place, what allowances are you making for the places that there's maybe not a high wait and list, but the reason there's not a high wait and list is because you're not making the place attractive by building more houses? Well, what I can do is I can the um, I can speak to the information officers about that and and, and feedback to you about the with the scoring for for the the query that you've just re requested. Was there any specific settlements that you were you were uh, you had in, in mind or? Well, no, I'm not going to be parochial about it, but villages in general, there's a lot of villages there that have pieces of ground in that, and due to obviously the fact that. Uh, property values are higher elsewhere for the same amount of roads that you build and they might not be getting so encouraged to build on. If they're not getting built by the private developers, then the place is less attractive for people to move into. So they're going to have a lower waiting list for people for houses until you actually do something to make people want to move there. So I'm just wondering if they're just getting missed out of the equation altogether. I think and um, that sort of places, but not one in particular. Because that the the, the list the, the uh, that, that mentions that settlements, it, it doesn't rule out any of the smaller settlements developing there. If a, if a right opportunity came along, we would certainly consider it if it was a, a financially a viable and obviously if there was, if was a demand there. I think Councillor Cross I think the offers there to give us some more information if 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 it required that might, yeah. might be helpful. That's right. That's nothing that we do if there was some sort of scoring system in there that allowed for that. Okay. Um can I go back to Councillor James's point? Can I go back to Councillor James's point about the new Scots integration strategy? Um I think there's just a general interest at the moment in terms of our Ukrainian families, in terms of our Syrian families, Afghan families in terms of their integration into society in Buchan. So it would be useful to have an informal session with Katie McLean or one of our team. Sure, uh, I'm more than happy to get that work out. That would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Clark, then. I think we will move on then to the recommendations. There are no more hands, no more comments. And um, thanks again for the report. So we recommend you to provide comment to Communities Committee on the Draft Strategic Housing Investment Plan 2025-2030 Appendix one and appendix two. Thank okay, you. thank you, Chair. Agreed. Yeah. Um are you happy to move on, folks, or do you want a five minute break? Are you just happy? Everybody okay, not too stiff. Okay, we'll just move on then. Um item eight is the review of the community asset transfer policy. Um and it's Amanda that's going to present this report to us this morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, the Community Asset Transfer Policy was originally approved on the 9th of June 2016, and therefore is now over five years old. So it is now um, time for that full review. 
the report um, updates committees on the progress being made and is seeking comments on the proposed amendments. You'll see the amendments are in red. Hopefully that makes it easier for you to see what the, the proposed changes are. The review was undertaken by um, area managers and um, other officers from services such as finance, our estates, our legal colleagues, economic development and World Life Aberdeenshire. So reflecting that risk of um, asset base that we have, but also reflecting there is a piece of uh, legislation around asset transfer in relation to the Community Empowerment Act. Council services and elected members via informal sessions were asked for feedback on the original proposals. There was feedback from all six areas and um, housing and building standards, finance and our education general services leadership team. And we've included that in Appendix 1A. Community groups were also invited to um, give us feedback. We did receive over uh, 40 responses and these are summarised in Appendix 1B. They're not verbatim, but it's a summary of the responses. Um, and also we have provided some information in relation to those comments. In terms of the main suggested changes to the policy, um, one of the key ones is the validation date. Previously, the validation date, which is, is a key date because it kicks off um, timescales, was um, a, a date that was agreed when the, the um, area operational group met and agreed that all the documents that they had received were valid. We have now changed that to it being as as soon as we get the information, all the information that's required, we don't check whether it's valid or not, but we, we ensure that that is the validation date that we work to. And that's really designed to try and keep a pace with the asset transfer request. We are very aware that the, the time it takes is something that people have commented on. There is a number of um, milestones within the legislation that means it is quite difficult for us to speed it up much but this is one way we can and um, the other kind of key changes are things like our marketing and disposal and what that meant in terms of whether asset transfer requests um, would be given um, precedence we're making it clearer that if we have received a formal uh, asset transfer request marketing and disposal cannot begin. If we have an expression of interest, there is no reason why the um, asset owner cannot go into marketing and disposal. But once we have that formal request, uh, a property that we want to dispose of cannot be marketed. We confirmed that um, charges for council legal services will be added during the conveyancing stage. We have made it clearer as to what happens at the end of existing asset transfer um, leases. That's partly because we are getting to that stage with some of our very early um, asset leases. So we have made it clear um, that there is a, a process and that a new request must be submitted from the existing tenants to allow us to progress. So we've really tried to tighten up the policy um, as we've kind of learned and, and our, our approach has matured. So we are looking for comments um, from our area committees that we will then take to Business Services Committee on the 16th of November 2023. And that report will seek approval for the um, policy. If the policy gets approval, we will then update the, the kind of package of forms and guidance that sits around this. So our application forms, our notes for the applicants are frequently, frequently asked questions. Um, and we will ensure that the calculation that we uh, undertake to look at the discount that we offer on an asset transfer will be based on the um, updated Aberdeenshire Council priorities. So happy to take any comments from the committee. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Councillor Croson, please. Thank you for that report. Um, I'm just reading through it, uh, to page 261, speaking of the clawback options for getting that property back if it doesn't work out. Um, if I'm maybe not reading it properly, but I can't really see anything in there that allows for, say, example, someone's got a 
long lease and a public hall and end up spending 70,000 pounds fixing the car park. Uh, well, that was would be made if there was a car park in that property. The money spent for improvements to the property would be taken into account. You see a potential is to buy it back and sell that property at a higher value than it would have been with some of the money spent on it. That would be another example of that, and that's probably the Thank you, Chair. Um, we, if if a um, community group that has taken ownership of an asset um, does decide to dispose of that property, um, and they have had a, a significantly discounted price, and I appreciate yes, they will have invested money into it, but um, we have. We have included that ability to claw back funding, and um, I would need to probably defer to my legal colleagues as to how they would calculate any clawback. Um, but it is something we're, we're very aware that we will often dispose of an asset at a at a pound or a very low rate, um, and well below the market value. And so, therefore, we we have said we we need to have some form of protection, but I don't know what the calculation would be in terms of financial fallback. Thankfully today we've not had any. Yeah, I don't think I'd be able to answer in terms of any calculation what that would be, but if you could take it back to the comment and see if we can get a response, might be helpful for you. Yeah, obviously I'm just thinking it works both ways. No, no other um, plans at the moment. Um, if I could make a couple of comments, Amanda, um, it's good to see a 2016 document updated. 2016 is nearly 10 years ago, never mind five. Um, and language like single outcome agreement and all the rest of it is now being superseded. So that we're actually given information when they inquire about a cat, or should say an ad, um, that they're, they're, they're getting something that is up to date. It shows the council in better light. Um, it's good to see that you've actually uh, done such a, an amount of work in terms of connecting groups that have already been through this process, or indeed groups that are currently interested in it, and trying to simplify it for the, the for communities that would want to go ahead with it. Um, I personally think it's been a good bit of legislation in terms of the Community Empowerment Act, and it, again, it's about building that capacity in communities to deliver services for themselves. So um, I welcome uh, the review. Uh, Welcome the comments. Having it in red did make it really helpful to see what was going in instead. It'll be good to see when the red comes out and actually get a copy of the finalised finalised doc document so that we, we know where we are. Um, the validation date thing's interesting as well because it's not validation. It's, it's maybe it needs to be called something else. Um, I don't know what you would call it, but uh, if you actually haven't actually validated the papers that have come into you, it's noting the receipt of the last bit of info you need to actually go ahead. To, to validate. So I've just put that in as a, a, wee, a wee addition from my own point of view because validation means to me almost acceptance and it's not quite there. So back to the review. I think that comes from the legislation to compare uh, um, legislation at first to validation. So some maybe it's yeah. quite a lot of discussion around that particular point. Okay, thank you. Right, I don't see any other other hands um, just checking everybody's still still with us thank you um so the committee is recommended that there are four one two one note the feedback comments details and appendices in one a member and service feedback and one b community feedback consider the draft amendments to the committee asset transfer policy as set out in appendix two with the proposed changes highlighted in red and associated documents and appendices three four and five one two three provide comments to the officer review group which will be considered for creating the final draft of the policy, which we've done. And note that comments will be recorded as part of the formal consultation process and will be reported to Business Services Committee on the 14th of November 2024. Agreed? Yeah, we move on. So, item nine Annual Scrutiny Improvement Report 2324. And it's Amanda again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. The committee is now considering the annual scrutiny report, which sets out the various elements of scrutiny undertaken by the committee in the last financial year. 
the scrutiny improvement at Aberdeenshire guidance in part four of the scheme of governance requires each committee to consider the language scrutiny and improvement report. The report gives councillors not only an opportunity to reflect on activity that has happened, but it's also an opportunity to consider any specific scrutiny they may, they may be keen to undertake in the future or any potential improvements to the way in which scrutiny sessions are organised or reported. The report highlights both formal scrutiny, this is scrutiny where the committee has reviewed, for example, performance, um, monitored service delivery through performance reports, policy development and review plans and strategies. So it's coming from to view during um, a formal committee and committee adds value by providing comments to the rel relevant policy committee or service and that's ensuring local leadership is influencing the development of strategies and work programmes that impact on the community's authority. Buckingham councillors also actively participate in a diverse range of less formal scrutiny through the programme of business. And whilst councillors may not always participate in sessions out with formal committee for a range of reasons, that can include health, employment or caring roles, the topics that councillors consider and support officers with um, include areas such as community planning, budget discussions, community council forums, development sessions and the appointment of senior officers. The committee also has a role in the scrutiny of partner organisations at that local level and there's regular consideration of the performance of partners such as Scottish Fire and Rescue Service, the Health and Social Care Partnership and Police Scotland. Councillors will be aware there is a full and varied programme of business already underway in this financial year and that's reviewed regularly with the Chair. However, I would want to take this opportunity to ask the committee to propose topics or areas of business which would benefit from appropriate scrutiny by the committee and enable continuous improvement in service delivery applicable to Buchan. And the area committee and I are happy to respond to any suggestions for improvement, questions or comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I see Councillor James has his hand up. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thanks for the introduction there. I um, often look back at this and then realise how much you have to do in a year. Um, it is quite incredible when you look at the number of topics that we cover. Um, I do hope I've speak for a lot of members around the table where there's a couple in the informal scrutiny that we probably would have liked to reflect it on more during the year. Uh, and that's namely the, the campus and uh, the Living Up um, project. Um, I think given the news last week, I think we could all reflect and think that you know, we would have liked to have been briefed on on, on the uh, community campus more throughout the year on, on ongoing process. Um, so as part of our uh, future plan scrutiny, I would suggest that we include both the regular updates on, on the process, uh, the progress of the, the, the community campus itself and on the process um, of the level and up projects, both are uh, kind of significant investment pieces for Peterhead um, and I think we really do need to be kept informed of how things are going. Uh, and with that in mind, I would also suggest that we have a statement about our business for regular updates. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Councillor Simpson, please. Thank you, Chair. I would agree with everything that Matthew just said. Um, in fact, I would like, if it was possible, for item four of the agenda going on be a briefing on the academy, the, the campus, and the levelling up. So, do you chair, is that a proposal for a standing item? Yes. On, on each yes. agenda? Yes. Um, I would certainly have no issue with that. I'll just double check with my legal colleague that that's. You, that's you, I don't think I don't think councillors want to make a formal motion, but I think there would be a game around the table that we all feel out of the loop. Yeah, yeah. Without those two subjects. No, I just come back again. Even if there's nothing to report, we need to know why there's nothing to report. Yeah, so just be specific about what it is you're looking to be updated on regularly, but just general an update. General. General. From the groups. Yeah. Both the the campus. And those two, and those two major projects, the yeah. community campus and the Wembley Park project. Thank you. Thank you. You sound the plan, guys, are closing? I would disagree with that as much as you want to get what is. There is nothing to report on that. I would rather have a sort of last night and maybe stand in so we can get on with the other business part. Yeah. Discussion be had in this discussion might not always be easy judged in how long it would last. Just that we think I'd like to get I just think it's we want a regular sure. every meeting report on whether it's an old report or and it doesn't have to be any before. No. I think that I think 
It was just a suggestion. Yeah, but just I think, I think there's I, I think there's consensus that we do it, but where it goes on the agenda, we will leave up to the chair and the officers. Because if there's a lot to report, it might be four. And if it's less to report, it could go further down. Um, Council James has asked for it to go on outstanding business. So um, it's just a different way, I think, of doing outstanding business. So we might remove it from the outstanding business report and just make it into a more formal scrutiny report. What's happening? If I could just come in, there might be items that might, um, uh, elements of that might be exempt. So perhaps putting it as um, Council Croson said at the end of the meeting might be better. Okay. I'm going to take that advice, Suzanne. Yeah. 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 We'll see. You're back. I think Councillor James has come back. She's come as number two, so I take it you put your hand back up. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think, uh, whilst there might well be exempt items or in the need briefings in the future, I think these could be dealt with as appendices at the end of the document, because given the way the project has gone today, I think public updates are important. So I think if we've got exempt um, parts of that briefing, it should be attended. Thank you. There's a huge amount of public interest. Sure, through you, I think we would we would be saying, unless there was a reason not to, we would always do as part of this. Are there any other comments from councillors about this particular item? Councillor Crossley. Yeah. Councillor Crossley. Yeah, I think it told us in the place, but um. This scrutiny in general, there was something that I was thinking about that as I was wondering if as a council you have a bad views in the years at all. And if we have, well, the fact that obviously the very nature of them we would be able to get a certain amount of detail, but more considering the amount of reviews and the cost of council for that that could maybe go by department. Do you chair an NDA a non disclosure agreement? Yeah. Okay, um, I can certainly take that, but uh, certainly I do know we have used them occasionally where we've had commercial and confidence. Um, I'm, I'm aware our economic development colleagues would probably be able to to get to site and a couple where they've done it. It's not an area I am familiar with. I think this is one that I need, and I'm not sure our legal colleagues would be. Yeah, I think I think we need to take that back and get some some other advice about that. But you're looking for the number of NDAs. As a council, and I sort of splitting my hair there as the big PM. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Right, um, I think that's probably as much as we need to say. Um, I just, but you know, I agree with council. Council James, when you actually look back at the work that we have looked at over the year, the diversity of it and the volume of it is quite amazing because I think if you're going to stay, you don't appreciate all of, all of that. And I just want to thank Council for the amount of huge amount of work she does in terms of pulling together all those informal briefings for us. Thank you. Um, right, so we are asked to consider and comment on the activities detailed in the report and to consider and agree any additional issues for the proposed programme and scrutiny activity for 2024-25, which we have done. So moving on then to item 10, which is actually our last item this morning, we don't have the exempt item. Um, Amanda, is that over to you again? It is. Thank you, Chair. Um, as ever, the statement of outstanding business is a way to um, keep track of any activity actions that have been requested as a result of our committee report that has been considered. We do have a number currently on our statement of, of outstanding business. Some of them do have dates that take us um, quite far forward and that is why they are there. We have provided uh, updates within the paper, but I also, um, unusually, because I haven't had to do this for a couple of months, but I have got some very updates, updates right. if that is okay. Um, in relation to um, action two, there will be informal briefing, informal meetings scheduled with the Buckinghead teachers for October, November, likely to be November, just recognising um, time skills for committee and the October holidays. In relation to item four, um, 
tenders have been returned and they are now being evaluated, it is likely that there will be an award report um, in the next couple of weeks and we would be expecting a completion date of around about uh, mid-December. We're anticipating a 10 weeks site duration. That was an update from Raymond Terrace. In relation to item six, Martin Hall has confirmed that we have not yet undertaken the survey at Balmore Terrace because we don't yet have our new contract in place for those traffic surveys. In relation to West Road, the design team are working through the list of crossing points to be delivered this year. West Road is one of them. There has been a site visit at West Road to inform that detailed design stage. However, no substantive work has begun, but it is still programmed for delivery this financial year. Um, in relation to item eight, that is still on the reserve list, but as soon as funding becomes available, it will be taken forward. In relation to item nine, um, repairs were carried out to the bridge parapet walls necessary due to a combination of past damage by um, vehicular impact from when the bridge was still open to vehicles. Um, but these had, these, this damage had been made worse by vandalism to the walls by the removal of stones loosened by the impacts. The repairs are to prevent further vandalism and to prefer, preserve historic uh, listed structure. Um, in terms of item 11, which is in relation to the play parks, um, I have received a list from John Sibbert, which I did not print off, and I now can't find it in my inbox, so I will circulate it. But I can confirm that in relation to the list of play parks, um, an update on Strickland has been provided separately to our Ward 4 colleagues. I will circulate play parks uh, after this meeting. In relation to item 12, there is now um, an informal session in the diary for 10th of September. And in relation to item 13, which is Clark Hill, we've had an update as follows. The work started on Monday the 19th as planned. The underlying ground conditions and weather has caused, it, caused a slight setback, but won't affect the completion date as there was an element of um, time built in. And for those of you who have maybe looked at the plans, you'll be aware we did have planters um, and additional greening in our original design. Unfortunately, our call for interest in looking after the planting did not result in any firm offers from any community groups to undertake the planting. However, the space for planters is being left and we will continue to work with community groups um, and hopefully reach an agreement um, either with a community group or a business that will allow us to put the planters there um, and have those uh, the, the planting uh, maintained by a third party. And that's all the updates I have, although I've just noticed Teresa has just given me an item with the proposals for the play park. So the proposals are New Pitch Ligo, Marketplace Phase 2, Longside Park Vale, the Aerial Runway, Cruden Bay, Castle Woods, a full replacement, and Peterhead Whitegates, a full replacement. So that's the play parks for our share of the Scottish Government play park funding in this year. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Amanda. Are there any questions, comments? Notice you've um, recommended the one about the next one, number 10 for the removal. Um, can that Clark Hill one come off, or do you want to wait until we get further? The Clark Hill Shopping Centre when it's finished. Okay. No, no comments? No, we're fine. So I think that is us you finished. Uh, can we stop the recording, please, Theresa? Thank you all. Great question. Well, I'm not.